Seattle's waterfront is one of the most alluring of all visitor attractions in a city which has literally hundreds of colorful and unusual points of interest. The magic of the waterfront attracts visitors from virtually every state in the nation. It is an ever-changing spectacle of souvenir seekers and people who want to participate in the good things of life. But before 1935, it was not so convenient. From the beginning, Seattle's progress has been linked with its waterfront. The waterfront has been Seattle's economic heartbeat since 1878. The central waterfront thoroughfare was called Railroad Avenue. Built from 1885 onward and patched and pieced together over the years, Railroad Avenue became a confusion of railroad tracks and trestles. Railroad Avenue was a street that varied in width from 140 to 180 feet. Since it was supported largely by timber trestles, it had become more and more inadequate. By 1930, large sections of the street had been blocked off or limited to light loads. Both vehicular and steam railway trackage along the waterfront occupied the streets and considerable confusion existed. A major construction program on this waterfront with its soft foundation and 16-foot tide range was essential to modernize the harbor line. The city engineering department made many studies of both temporary and permanent development. But since cost estimates ran into enormous amounts of money, the program was postponed time and again. A design was finally worked out which combined the permanent features with the use of timber and wood. Since the cost of this plan was far below the lowest possible cost for a more standard type seawall and adjudged to be permanent, it was adopted and used for the project. It must be remembered that the seawall design was a compromise plan, combining concrete, steel, wood, and aggregate backfill. The main features of this design were the use of precast concrete wall slabs, which removed the necessity of expensive coffer dams, sheet piling to protect the fill, timber piling foundations, and relieving platforms to carry the weight of the fill and prevent settlement into the soft bottom of the shoreline. Aggregate backfill, which will be hauled in later by barges. The design included moving the railroad tracks to the east side and paving the street to carry traffic on top of the filled area. The limits of the project extended from Bay Street on the north to Madison Street on the south. In January 1934, the Manson Construction and Engineering Company was awarded the contract for driving the piling, and they moved two pile driving units on the job. A third rig was brought in to drive sheet piling. Special equipment was brought in to drive the batter piles, which are piling driven at an angle to carry the tension load and resist the overbalancing tendency of the wall itself. After the piling had been driven and cut off to grade for the foundation, heavy wood timbers called shear caps were placed on top of the piling. 
Of special interest was the use of the tide for placing the 60-foot, 12-inch by 18-inch timbers. They were hauled from the framing yard to the water and dumped into the bay. They were then floated into approximate position at high tide, and as the tide receded, they were lowered into exact position and secured. Since it was impossible to drive the piling in precise alignment, the city inspectors and surveyors had to take the measurements between the piles each day. These measurements were then transferred to the timber shear caps in the framing yard so that each cutout would match its own individual pile. This is the framing yard where all the work was done by city employees hired by the day. The timbers were purchased through the city purchasing department. The precast concrete wall slabs were cast by the General Construction Company of Seattle. The site for the casting yard was located on the west side of the Duwamish waterway where there was ample space for storage. In the precast slabs for the seawall, one of the principal requirements was to obtain concrete that would be highly resistant to salt water, particularly on the face exposed to constant tidal action. Their design was such that the effective location of the seal reinforcing bars would be near the rear of the wall slab, giving maximum cover between steel and seawater. The sheet piling and reinforcing steel was manufactured in the Bethlehem Steel Companies in West Seattle. These remarkable shots taken during that time show the process by which the hot steel was formed into one and one quarter inch square steel reinforcing bars. Quality control of the concrete was maintained by the City Engineering Department Testing Laboratory. Specifications required that the concrete show a 3,000 pounds per square inch resistance under compression. This requirement was always exceeded. Engineering Department inspectors examined each slab to ensure that there were no defects in the finished section. The faces of the slabs had an almost glossy smoothness. Each slab was numbered in numerical order, cataloged, and placed in proper sequence. And they were loaded in the same order to ensure a perfect fit in the seawall. Heavy-duty cranes were brought in to load the wall slabs in the casting yard and to set them in place on the project. The wall slabs were 18 inches thick, 8 feet wide, and 20 feet long. They weighed approximately 23 tons. Because much of this work was done at or below extreme low water level, only a few tides each month were suitable for efficient work. It was decided to utilize a diver and work all tides, but this was found to be very costly and inefficient. It was then concluded 
that the most effective procedure was to get everything in readiness and put on a very large crew whenever a low tide existed. The men worked sometimes in the water, but it was found that the job could be done faster and better at about one-fifth the cost. Here one can see the wall slabs in place and the method by which they were secured. Notice that the concrete shear beams extending from the face of the wall are keyed. Concrete was placed between them to form a solid unit. One inch steel rods were used as tiebacks to keep the wall in exact position. The Crosby Sand and Gravel Company furnished ready mixed concrete to the job. This company later became Pioneer Sand and Gravel Company. Their contract was for furnishing concrete to the job site only. Placing it was performed by city employees hired by the day. A major feature of the operation was the method of compacting the concrete. This was done by using vibrators progressively in the pour. Vibrators were used to minimize the existence of air bubbles in the cement and to ensure a dense placement. The program of keeping vehicular, rail, and pedestrian traffic operating at all times, both on the street and docks, was a major problem. But all business and traffic were given the right-of-way in the construction area. The source of aggregate backfill for the project was the mouth of the Cedar River, located at the south end of Lake Washington near Renton. Barges were loaded by clam derricks and towed north through Lake Washington and the government locks around to the job site. At the job site, the backfill was loaded into loading hoppers and hauled by truck to the embankment area. The aggregate backfill was a coarse material, and although it did not require compaction, it was sluiced into the fill to obtain maximum density. A sidewalk was constructed along the entire length of the project. The hand railings for the sidewalk were cast in the framing yard. They were hauled by truck to the job site and placed by hand by city employees. Special templates were used to space the pickets. The templates were slit, held together by bolts, so that they could be easily removed. The name Railroad Avenue was changed by city ordinance to Alaskan Way in July 1936. And so ends this chapter in the city engineering department's continuing role in the history of Seattle.